Fantastic. So welcome everyone to this uh, BME seminar series. Um, I begin with my uh, with paying my respect to the First Nation, uh, Nation custodian of country throughout New South Wales, in particular the Gadigal people of Euro Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which University of Sydney is built. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm Omid Kaveh, I'm the deputy head of a school for research at Biomedical Engineering School and it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carolina Mora Lopez uh, from IMEC. She's a principal member of technical staff and research and development team leader. And we just found out that one of the Bionic Eye <laughs> engineers was actually working in, his, in her team as well. Um, so today's talk is um, on silicon technology and circuit innovation for wearable and implantable hair scale solutions. I asked Carolina in particular to give us a perspective about IMEC as well. It's like what, what is the depth and breadth of uh, biomedical engineering research uh, in, um, in IMEC. Carolina received her PhD degree in electrical engineering in 2012 from KU Leuven, Belgium. You know, this is a, one of the uh, most respected um, universities in, in the world. And um, she joined, I think during her PhD was also linked with IMEC because KU Leuven has a very deep links with IMEC and she was uh, working um, as a researcher after that uh, as an analog designer focused on interfacing with neural, um, uh, for neural sensing, sensing application. Well, what is, what we know most Carolina for is uh, her, um, leadership in developing NeuroPixel, um, uh, both versions one and version two. Uh, these are basically neuroprops for uh, enabling a lot of researchers from various um, institutes to do neuroscience research. She is currently principal scientist and team leader um, of circuit and systems um, for neural interfaces at IMEC. And um, I think uh, today's talk is very much is going to be eye-opening for us in terms of what IMEC is doing. And I hand over to you, Carolina, with that. Okay. Thanks a lot for the very nice introduction. I think that covered also uh, a part of I wanted to uh, introduce myself. So thanks a lot. So I'm Carolina. I work at IMEC, which is a Belgian research institute. And indeed, I'm here to talk about uh, wearable and implantable uh, silicon technologies um, that we have or are uh, working on at IMEC. Uh, so for the people here that doesn't know uh, IMEC, uh, IMEC is a, a world leading research and development institute working on nanoelectronics and nanotechnologies. And we work together with many uh, industrial and academic partners uh, to try to impact society by inno uh, creating innovative solutions in many fields related to semiconductor technology, life sciences, imaging, large area electronics, photonics. So it's very, very uh, broad topic. Um, the IMEC uh, Institute has around eight sites worldwide and it employs more than 4,500 4, uh, international uh, researchers and uh, professionals. And um, one of the unique properties of, of the Institute itself is that it has a very uh, modern and specialized infra infrastructure. And within these infrastructures, there are two clean rooms, one 200 millimeter clean room dedicated mostly to sensor technologies and another clean room 300 millimeters, uh, mostly dedicated to CMOS scaling. Um, so with this technology, we, we normally partner then with uh, many industrial uh, uh, yeah, organizations uh, to try to provide then uh, semiconductor solutions uh, for them. The revenue of IMEC comes mostly from these industrial partners. 
uh, but there are also big uh, regional and European investments uh, for our research. And uh, then we are collaborating with more than 600 industrial partners uh, and also academics. And uh, because of the research that we are doing, uh, we create a lot of spin-off companies and startups uh, that come out from, from the results of our uh, work. So from this infrastructure, uh, something very important for life science, which is the research I want to talk about, is the ability to create um, uh, um, nanoscale features um, down to six nanometers. And this is important because it allows us to create uh, nanopores and nanochannels, photonics and electronics on demand uh, for life science and healthcare. And this can be combined also with the standard CMOS processes to create uh, more advanced uh, biomedical devices. So we have teams uh, fully dedicated to ASIC and multi-physics design. Uh, and we have also a lot of labs for uh, characterization, not only electrical, but also uh, from the biology side. And also very important is that because of the clean rooms, it's also possible for IMEC to scale up uh, products that we develop together with uh, our partners uh, to low volume production, for example, to bring part of these uh, devices to the market. Okay, so that was the introduction uh, about IMEC. Uh, now I will focus entirely to all the life science and healthcare uh, research. And um, I will show uh, also part of the, the research that is done in my team. So um, the business of IMEC has been many years uh, the semiconductor scaling. Uh, with our the state of the art infrastructure and also the partnerships we have uh, with many key players, we have been able to contribute to this accelerated growth uh, in uh, CMOS technologies. And still nowadays, uh, CMOS scaling is one of the core programs at IMEC. And while the price of um, uh, the size and the speed of, of silicon or semiconductor uh, products has scaled significantly, uh, as you can see here, several orders of magnitude, um, the question that we still have for life science is how can we use this silicon technology to transform uh, healthcare? And we believe that co by combining the silicon technology with other technology and system innovations, it is possible to improve uh, healthcare uh, affordability, quality, and coverage. But the question is, can we bring this uh, the same proportional amount of functionality as it is achieved with silicon scaling? So when we want to create interfaces between technology and biology, uh, we need to think of dimensions and scale. Uh, so thanks to the recent progress in micro and nanolithography, uh, it is actually possible to fabricate uh, silicon features uh, with similar dimensions are biology uh, uh, components such as uh, blood cells, bacteria, antibodies, and even DNA. And this is very important because it opens up uh, many possibilities of interfacing with these uh, biological parts. And another uh, important aspect uh, related to the interfaces with biology uh, is also the complexity. So not only scale, the scale is important, but also the complexity we can achieve. And this is because uh, the, 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 the body and the brain are also very uh, complex uh, organs. So it is, um, we can say actually that uh, with the advanced CMOS technologies that exist today, we are already able to uh, fabricate devices that resemble uh, the level of complexity of our human brain. And this is quite amazing. So now that we have the technology at the right scale of biology, and we also have the complexity, uh, the question here is, uh, what can we do with it? So how, we, how can we use this technology to really radically improve uh, healthcare? So at IMEC, uh, we do research in multi multidisciplinary fields uh, in order to advance life science technologies at all levels. 
So to be able to create very powerful uh, chip platforms, uh, we need to integrate all our capabilities in customized electronics, uh, integrated sensor solutions, integrated photonics and microfluidics. And this integration is important uh, because it allows us not only to interface with biology in the, using very different modalities, uh, but also allows us to fabricate uh, very small devices uh, with advanced electronic features, uh, with high throughput, uh, with high accuracy uh, and robustness, and very importantly, also at reduced cost. Uh, so this uh, view summarizes very well what are our uh, design targets or research targets uh, within our IMEC research activities. So our activities in healthcare cover um, different uh, stages of uh, product development, such as discovery, preclinical and clinical, uh, and also different medical specialities, such as therapeutics, uh, diagnosis, prevention, and augmentation. And in this presentation, I wanted to highlight four specific areas uh, of our research. Um, although there are uh, many more areas, I will not be able to cover all this. Um, but um, an important aspect also is uh, to notice that uh, all our research, for example, in these four areas, always includes a very close collaborations of teams at IMEC that are dedicated to process technology and material exploration, uh, chip and hardware design. And there are also now uh, important uh, software teams that are dedicated to application and signal processing um, in order to create a complete systems in some of these areas. So I will start then covering these uh, topics uh, and I will start uh, with the genomics and big data. So accurate uh, and rapid uh, DNA sequencing um, would have a profound impact on human diseases and personalized medicine. And when we look at existing technologies, um, we can see that the non uh, nanoport uh, technologies uh, require a great deal of sampling preparation and complicated algorithms for data processing. We can also see that the sequencing cost is actually um, almost completely dominated by uh, the cost of the reagents that are needed for the assays. So uh, nanopore uh, based sequencers are the fourth generation uh, DNA sequencing technology, and it is expected to have a great potential uh, to quickly and reliably um, uh, sequence the entire human genome for a very reduced price. So they are expecting um, in, in the, in the uh, let's say the trend of sequencing development that they can reach prices of uh, around $100 per genome. At the moment, this is uh, rather close to $1,000. Uh, so this uh, type of uh, advancement is possible, for example, by integrated synthetic nanopores that can further be integrated on uh, circuit uh, chip technology, uh, which, which offers the potential for highly parallelized, uh, miniaturized and portable DNA sequences. And uh, while previous uh, technologies or existing technologies are focused uh, either on uh, trying to have very long reads of DNA sequencing or a, a large amount of sensors. What they expect is that this fourth generation of sequencing can have both in order to achieve the highest uh, throughput possible. Uh, so DNA analysis uh, from extraction from sequencing uh, typically inv evolve, uh, involves very complex and time consuming assays. Um, that require also many cycles of adding reagents uh, and watching steps. And ideally, if we want to improve this, uh, a screening device should be small, should be fast, and should be easy to use as well. So this is where uh, microfluidics uh, start to make a significant impact on medical diagnostics. And microfluidics refer to a small devices, such as the one here, uh, that can uh, analyze tiny amount of uh, fluids, such as, for example, a droplet of uh, blood or even smaller amounts than that. And microfluidics are very interesting uh, uh, 
uh, not only to reduce the volume of the reagents, which as mentioned before, is the highest cost of, of sequencing um, um, and reduce also the overall size, but it also allows a, a new way of doing a lab work that is called lab on a chip. So this refer to uh, different laboratory steps that you can do uh, with a single uh, silicon chip. Um, a time um, so we do research also on trying to see different type of sensors that can improve uh, sequencing. Uh, and uh, we see this from two perspectives, from next generation sequencers, uh, focus on large arrays or also single molecule uh, sequencers that are uh, focused on uh, long reads. And in the second case, uh, we normally combine uh, photonics or electronic sensors together with nanopores uh, in order to achieve these longer reads. And uh, nanopores are uh, very trending in this type of application, not only because allowed to, to create these longer reads, uh, but also because it uh, makes the sample preparation uh, very easy. So this is really the technology to go towards a higher throughput if, and a faster sample to answer systems uh, for point of care uh, sequencing. So when we look at the cost of sequencing, we have seen that it has been uh, significantly reduced in the last years uh, to something close to $1,000 uh, per genome. Um, but the amount of data produced in a single run has uh, increased proportionally. And this is, of course, a huge uh, uh, cost uh, in terms of data analysis um, and uh, data storage. So therefore, uh, there is um, an important effort uh, in many research uh, uh, yeah, universities and centers trying to look at high performance computing and machine learning uh, as an important component uh, to, com uh, to a complete uh, genome uh, platform. So extremely high performance uh, or exascale computing is a skill which is often associated with uh, big supercomputers or server farms. Uh, but in reality, a lot uh, more different uh, computer architectures are used uh, to scale up the performance of life science uh, software algorithms. And at IMEC, uh, we are very well placed to match uh, the most uh, appropriate hardware uh, platform availabilities with the best optimized uh, software algorithms as well. So this is an important step also to bring uh, gen genome uh, sequencing uh, a step further. So I want to talk now about cell therapy. And uh, one of the important applications here is cancer research. And this is because cancer is still today one of the leading causes of death around the world. And although detection, early detection and drug delivery uh, and development have helped a lot, uh, there are many emerging uh, treatments that are promising to tackle the remaining challenges of this disease. So if we look at the cancer incidence worldwide, uh, we can see that there are around uh, 14 million new cancer cases every year. And um, they also estimate that more than one in three people in the Western world develops a uh, cancer. And this is of course a huge economic uh, impact to health, uh, healthcare uh, systems uh, in all countries. So if we think uh, of, of new uh, therapies, then cell and gene therapies are ex exciting new areas of medicines that are just starting to gain uh, regulatory approval. And they cover a wide range of individual treatments uh, from CAR T cell, T -cell uh, cancer therapies to regenerative medicine for rare uh, genetic diseases and degenerative disorders uh, such as leukemia uh, or Parkinson's. Uh, and these therapies normally involve uh, removing or selecting cells uh, from patients and uh, re-engineering them either by modifying their genetic codes or growing more of a specific uh, cell type that is lacking in the patient. Once these cells are grown, then they can be transferred back to the patient 
uh, for the treatment. So uh, in order to contribute to this type of research, uh, uh, we are currently uh, having several projects that try to develop uh, building blocks that are required to miniaturize and increase the performance of uh, cytometry systems. So our vision is try to use silicon technology uh, to evolve the current uh, large equipment uh, as shown here into a very small chip um, that includes uh, everything into a single uh, small device. So we have already developed a compact and disposable uh, cell sorter system uh, with integrated on chip characterization and downstream molecular analysis uh, of the cell content through an on-chip digital PCR. And by combining some uh, bubble switch actuator with silicon chip technology and integrated photonics, uh, the device allows for a much uh, more uh, versatile design that can be applied to many therapeutic and diagnostic applications. Uh, similarly, uh, we have also developed a CMOS chip that enables single cell electroporation. Uh, so a, a possible application uh, could be that uh, once you find the right cells uh, using the cell sorter of the previous slide, you can reprogram these cells by opening um, membrane pores and inserting uh, viral vectors into the cells. And uh, this picture here shows an example how single cell electroporation uh, can be used to inject fluorescent dyes into a specific cells in a very controlled uh, way. Okay, so now I would like to move to uh, non-invasive um, biomonitoring. So this is uh, now a different topic, more related to healthcare. So um, IMEC has been working for many years already on uh, non-invasive health monitoring covering both uh, wearable and non-contact devices. And uh, this research has been done for uh, many medical applications, as uh, you can see here. Uh, and we have uh, developed many devices uh, in partnership with many academic and industrial partners. And uh, for example, we have developed some uh, wrist uh, monitors for psychiatric applications, also EEG headsets uh, applied to neurology some uh, mock-up artificial kidney also to study uh, renal functions. Uh, we have been working also for a while on non-contact sensing uh, seats and beds in order to monitor um, cardiorespiratory uh, uh, signs. Uh, together with uh, also some uh, company in the US, we have developed some monitor uh, of uh, sign uh, vital signs from babies using a, a pregnancy patch and also develop uh, some uh, smart watches that can uh, be applied also to cardiology um, together with some uh, chest patches for cardiac monitoring. Uh, and finally, we have also had some small projects working on uh, smart lenses uh, for um, detection and uh, interaction for ophthalmological applications. So these are just some examples of things we have done uh, over the years. Um, but uh, one common thing of, of the work we do and that we specialize in IMEC is on all the electronics that goes inside those devices. Um, so as shown in those previous examples, we have been developing core technology to bring a vital monitoring into a much smaller form factor and uh, focusing also on ultra low power consumption. Um, and over, over the years, we have focused on improving the signal quality and reliability even under ambulatory use, uh, which is important for some of those applications. And, uh, uh, Every time we have tried to strive for a higher degree of integration. So 
Such uh, disposable solutions uh, for, for healthcare should include many components that range from microcontrollers, power and clock management, and connectivity. Uh, and even though a system like this uh, is lower cost in terms of bill of materials um, and other existing devices, I think the cost of all these little components add up and it is very difficult to make it uh, truly a single use is possible. Uh, so what we have done at IMEC then uh, after developing such system is to go for a fully integrated solution. Uh, so we have been able to push uh, the cost completely down uh, by integrating all functionality that we had before at a system level into a true uh, system on a chip. And uh, our latest uh, chip for healthcare is uh, the Music V3 which is a CMOS chip developed by IMEC a few years ago, which has, was the first fully integrated um, IC for wearable health solutions. And this chip uh, integrated all important parts that we wanted to uh, include to target many applications. So we had multimodal analog readouts, we have fully integrated power management and connectivity. We also included some DSP capabilities, uh, security features, and all these while consuming very low power. Um, okay, so now I will move to the ingestibles and implantables, which is also a part of the work that we do uh, in our team. And uh, also over the years, IME has been working on devices that can be implanted uh, such as brain implants, and also very recently working on uh, insertables or ingestibles. And uh, this transition from um, wearables to implantables has been very important because it comes with a lot of changes uh, in the way we do design, and um, not only from the chip, but also as a system as a whole. So when you move from device that can be uh, worked uh, with certain dimensions to something that can be fully implanted, you need to take care of uh, encapsulation, you need to take care of a powering. Uh, for example, powering cannot be done anymore inside the device uh, by a battery because the batteries uh, cannot be as small as, as, as we need. So all the powering and communication needs to be now wireless. So this brings then a, a new set of, of skills and research lines uh, that have broadened a bit our activities at IMEC. So in order to um, have uh, all these uh, implantable building blocks together, we have been collaborated with several teams at IMEC to work on wireless powering and charging, to work on a wireless compliant communication. Um, uh, our team is specialized on uh, sensors and uh, ASIC design for redouts of these sensors. We also have uh, capabilities to do uh, biocompatible implantable electrodes. Uh, a very, very important part of this research is also people working on software and algorithms for signal processing for uh, feature extraction and modeling, and this enables actually many applications. And finally, very important is the packaging and encapsulation. Uh, this is also special research that we do with one of the groups at IMEC, uh, specialized in, in materials for long-term stability um, of uh, devices that need to be implanted. So one of our very recent uh, research lines is ingestible technology and uh, the target the gastrointestinal tract. And our main motivation to start this activity was the fact that very little technology developments have been done in the GI tract, but this is still a very important part of the body that is linked to many diseases. Uh, so now IMEC is trying to develop an ingestible technology platform uh, that combines sensor technologies with uh, AI models, uh, ultra low power electronics. Uh, we are looking at uh, wireless interfacing for powering and communication, uh, also location detection capabilities. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work uh, dedicated to integration and prototyping um, of these devices. 
So I would like to bring this technology as mature as uh, implants for CNS or PNS uh, uh, that are currently available now. And uh, to be able to do that, we need to tackle many challenges. And many challenges exist because we need to stabilize the samples in the GI tract. Uh, we need to be able to localize the devices. We need uh, to find what are the best biomarkers for um, biochemical sensing, we need to deal with uh, miniaturization and also microfluidics. So there are many technological aspects that are involved in such uh, smart pills or ingestible pills. Um, and to take this, uh, um, to tackle these challenges, IMEC is currently developing two types of pills, uh, one for sampling and one for sensing. So the sampling pill uh, will make it possible uh, to take a sample from a specific location uh, in the gastrointestinal tract and uh, to do offline analysis. And I think this is also a very important uh, research tool that will allow us to understand uh, which biomarkers are important to be uh, tracked uh, in this application. And the other pill, which is the sensing pill, uh, will combine different sensors, uh, such as uh, pH, uh, temperature, uh, oxidation reduction potentials, uh, etc. And uh, because it is a non-invasive tool uh, that allows real-time uh, measuring uh, of potentials, it is a valuable uh, it is a valuable tool for closed-loop uh, therapeutics. And uh, uh, a final example from this part of insertables before moving uh, more in detail maybe to uh, neurotechnology. Uh, I wanted to show you this uh, retinal implant. Uh, so we have worked uh, for a while on developing uh, such device. Also, uh, it uh, requires a lot of uh, interaction be between different groups working on materials, uh, working on chip design, working uh, on, on, on wireless communication. And uh, this, um, this platform was originally thought of as an eye sensing and actuation platform, uh, but we are hoping that uh, such developments can also uh, impact next generation of thermological devices. And uh, to, to further move, let's say, this research uh, forward, uh, this is still require quite some technologies, um, technology development that uh, we are well positioned at IMEC uh, to continue. So uh, to close this part, uh, before uh, moving a little bit more in detail to neurotechnology, I, I wanted to to make a summary that um, although I we have shown I have shown many of these IMEC uh, healthcare technologies, but we are still open to find many more, especially focus on closed loop and specifically for, for drug uh, delivery. So an example here is uh, we want to be able to sense a, a certain parameter, a certain condition by using a multimodal sensing, uh, be able to extract with uh, signal processing uh, important um, aspects or learnings from this condition, and with this information, actuate uh, also through different means. And an example of an application would be where you sense uh, somehow some pathological condition, uh, you analyze uh, uh, your data in real time, and by uh, being able to actuate, you can uh, deliver, for example, drugs. Uh, based on, on, on the requirements of the patient. So this is a nice example of how say, such type of uh, closed loop system could use for personalized medicine. And this is uh, then one of our visions at IMEC uh, for future developments in healthcare. Then in the last part of my presentation, I would like to focus on, on neurotechnology, uh, which is a topic that um, uh, yeah, my team works uh, more in depth. Uh, and uh, one of the motivations here, there are many motivations to try to understand the brain, uh, but one important one that uh, is in our, uh, uh, let's say, target at the moment are mental illnesses. And uh, the reason for this is that mental illnesses are becoming one of the most costly um, 
diseases worldwide, uh, more than cancer, diabetes, and respiratory diseases all together. And the reason is that many people worldwide are having or suffering mental illnesses. And at the moment, there are no uh, very efficient treatments uh, for, for such illnesses. Um, so at IMEC, we have created many platforms to try to understand uh, uh, the brain in general and neural networks. And um, we have followed two approaches. One is uh, from outside, so using uh, in vitro uh, high uh, density uh, platforms uh, to study neural networks um, by themselves. So for example, we have developed the CMOS chip that includes a very high array of electrodes in which you can grow uh, cells and specifically uh, neurons. Uh, this can be used to study um, uh, cancer uh, or other types of, of diseases related to um, uh, neural networks. So you can see here uh, how a such platform had been used to grow uh, neurons on top. Uh, to study, for example, a neural, uh, how the neural network formation, how neurons communicate to each other, um, and uh, how uh, diseases uh, can develop or how drugs can actuate also. Uh, so these uh, neurons are in uh, very close contact with the electrodes. And um, for example, here you can see that uh, because of the very large uh, array of electrodes, you can actually be in contact with not only with the cell bodies, but also uh, with the dendrites. So this is a powerful tool to be able to study uh, many aspects of neural networks. And one of the applications uh, we have now uh, for this type of uh, platform is to uh, try to understand Parkinson's disease. And this is a project that is uh, currently running with several uh, academic and hospital partners. Uh, and it's very exciting because uh, it allows to study many aspects uh, without doing animal research. And the other um, side of our research then to try to understand the brain has to do with neural probes. And uh, we have also done uh, very extensively uh, research on how to develop silicon technologies uh, that uh, for, uh, let's say, brain implants and uh, neural probes. And here, miniaturization is, is the key motivation. So we have been able then over the last years to reduce what neuroscientists uh, typically use for neural recording all into a single chip that allows a much higher throughput and uh, a large amount of uh, data recorded for the brain. So our history in neural probes also uh, comes for, for many years already. So we have developed several generations of these tools. Uh, and very importantly, one of them, that is uh, the NeuroPixels probe. And it is the first uh, CMOS neural probe that was introduced into the market uh, and, and is now available to the neuroscience community. Uh, the last one is the NeuroPixels 2 that is also going to be available uh, very soon. So I want to show you uh, very briefly what is uh, inside such probe. Um, so what is special about this probe is that it integrates uh, electronics uh, into the silicon uh, to create a, a fully CMOS active neural probes. And the motivation to do this is that we wanted to be able to record many more sensors uh, using a single device and without having to connect many wires that come outside the probe. So it, uh, to be able to reduce the wiring from uh, 1000 electrodes that are integrated into the implantable shank of this probe, uh, we integrated in amplifiers, we integrated multiplexing and analog to digital conversion in the probe. So only a few wires uh, come out of the probe in a digital format. So. The specifications, so main specifications here is to be able to achieve very low noise and also very low power because this device is uh, implanted and in contact with the tissue. Uh, these devices are fabricated uh, using a standard CMOS technology and a special 
a post processing in our iMeclin room. And this is for electrode fabrication and probe simulation. So this is a very typical, let's say, process that we do at iMec using a standard CMOS technology and completing our uh, processing uh, in our uh, iMec clean room. And uh, here you can see some details of this probe uh, when it's fully processed. So you can see that we can achieve very um, thin and narrow implantable shanks. So all this needle that you see here is what you implant in the brain. And uh, the part um, that has uh, most of the electronics is uh, outside of the brain. And um, this uh, uh, probe included a large array of um, low impedance and biocompatible electrodes that uh, are important to provide a stability of recording over several months um, in, in a chronic experiment. So at TIMEC, we don't only develop uh, silicon devices or the probes, but we also uh, develop full systems that include the packaging into flexible uh, PCBs. We develop head stages and also full uh, acquisition systems that can be connected to many of these devices simultaneously. And all this allows a very uh, advanced experiments where a lot of data can be collected uh, from a single brain uh, at the same time. So this uh, type of uh, instrumentation is already making a, a lot of impact. So one of the earliest publications in Nature firstly demonstrated how such device can actually enable reading uh, activity from the brain uh, from different uh, brain regions. And this is because the needle that we implant uh, includes electrodes uh, all along the needle. So you can basically cover uh, in a single implant uh, different regions. And uh, after this publication, there have been many other publications following more on the research part, uh, where they have already some very nice insights on how different brain regions communicate to each other uh, and how certain brain regions are important for um, different, uh, say, animal functionality. But uh, our research on IMEC uh, has not been done only to understand the brain. So we have tried to work also more on clinical aspects uh, such as prosthetic devices. And um, I think uh, one of the examples is a prosthetic arm uh, where although all the robotics has been already very advanced uh, with um, yeah, with all advanced in materials and uh, mechanical, uh, engineering, there's uh, still some um, remaining uh, issues when trying to achieve bidirectional communication, uh, for example, with sensors. And bidirectional communication is very important because um, this is, um, you need the feedback uh, from, from your hand on how much force do you apply to a certain object, uh, uh, the temperature of that object, uh, or several things like that that can help you to control very uh, a prosthetic arm. And this bidirectional communication is not always there. So uh, it is important to be able to integrate sensors uh, together with your uh, robotics uh, into a, a, a complete uh, neural interface uh, between the robotic and uh, your brain. So at time we have um, trying to develop in the past uh, some uh, implants that can help to interface these devices uh, in two ways, one uh, by recording and one by stimulating individual uh, nerve bundles. So such device that you see here is flexible and can be implanted into the nerve to uh, stimulate and record and uh, tr uh, then try to enable a uh, much advanced uh, communication uh, between the nerves, uh, the electronics and the brain. Uh, this uh, type of implant also requires some chip design, uh, a lot of material sci science and encapsulation because it was a full implantable device. So with this application, I would like to uh, close also this part of, of implants. Uh, 
I think there are many other ways to interface with the neuron system uh, because it connects to all parts of the body. And uh, this is important to be able to connect, to, to, to innovate and create more applications uh, for, for this type of advanced devices. Um, for example, um, if you look at uh, the vagus nervous system, uh, it is also responsible for many uh, disorders and uh, functionality. Um, and there are already also many groups trying to work on making implants uh, or, uh, or wearable devices that can interface with such nerves. So yes, uh, here to conclude a bit, um, all our research at IMEC requires multidisciplinary innovation. Uh, I have shown that uh, we require uh, the work of circuit design of technology advancement in terms of material and sensors. Uh, we need to create systems for closed loop and open loop applications. And uh, also we require algorithms. And it's only by innovating in all these fields that we are able then to create uh, devices that can create an impact on life science and healthcare. And um, we are happy also to, to be able to collaborate uh, with many partners to achieve this, because as you can know, we cannot innovate but ourselves. So collaborations for us are, are very important. And we have many types of collaboration with industry and academia. I wanted to highlight here maybe uh, important aspects of uh, how collaboration can be done at IMEC. For example, uh, if we look at R&D, we can collaborate through public funded projects. For example, the Horizon Europe um, allows to, to collaborate countries in Europe, but also is, uh, allows to collaborate with con uh, special countries that have collaborations uh, such as Australia. At IMEC, we offer a lot of opportunities for students. So uh, internships at master topics are all the year published in our website. This can be important also for some student exchange. Uh, we also offer PhD as postdoc opportunities in our unique environment. And very recently, IMEC also have a tenure track for scientists that are looking to start a new research line and they are interested in the IMEC infrastructure. Uh, so all these opportunities can be available in our website if you want to see uh, more details. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Carolina. Um, yeah, I think um, I just, um, if, if people want to start to collaborate, maybe I start with this question with, with IMEC, whether they want to share ideas or they have an IP or something uh, that they want to develop further. Could you could you give an example of how, where they start, who to approach? Um, you know, yeah, so it, it depends a little bit um, on who the person is and what kind of collaboration the person is looking for. So there are many aspects. So for example, uh, uh, when a small companies or people have in data technology and they are interested, for example, to bring it to the next level, that's like the typical, IMEC collaboration, where uh, IMEC has the infrastructure to bring a technology uh, to the next level. So the, the person will partner, uh, the person can contact someone uh, the person knows, and this person can then bring the, the, the team that is required to, to discuss the technical and, uh, and business aspects of, of such a type of collaboration. And in this collaboration, indeed, uh, what is in for IMEC, uh, IMEC likes to do technology transfer. So this is like the main model where we do research, but IMEC doesn't sell products. So normally uh, the, the, the normal business line is that we transfer the technology back to the, the company that, uh, that first did the, 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 the contact. Um, Another type of collaboration is, okay, if, if the, the, the person or company uh, doesn't have the funds to, 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 to pay for research, uh, what we normally do is to try to look an opportunity together through funded projects. Uh, so we can write a proposal together um, and we decide together where we send it and try to look for funding that allows us to work together. Uh, that's uh, the other type of uh, collaboration that is possible. 
And, and, and for students, it's different because they can always find an opportunity. And like that's, placement uh, or, or other things, uh, like yes. going for internship. Yes, that's, yeah, that's a correct. opportunity, I think. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I, I have uh, a few more questions, but maybe I open for the floor. Maybe, Greg, do you have a, any question or comment? Or? Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, thanks for your really nice talk. Um, just have a question on, on actually slide number 36. Um, you had a, um, a really interesting hermetic encapsulation that uh, I, I don't know if you're working on it directly. I think you mentioned that you're working with someone else on it. But I was curious to understand how you get signals in and out of that kind of encapsulation. And this is a slide you mentioned? Uh, or 36, 36. So three, three oh, 36. Yeah. OK. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So um, so indeed, this is a group uh, of IMEC that is um, in another city. So uh, it's a university group and um, they work on uh, different materials, like a stack of materials to be able to encapsulate uh, silicon devices and also to bring a uh, widening uh, out of the device. And that's an important part. Uh, so your question was related to, to the material itself. Uh, no, so if we look at the thin chip, for example, yes. um, there, it looks like there's some pads up near the, uh, the orange dimensions that are shown there on the far right. Yes. Um, that would presumably have a, an electrical signal associated with it. You'd want to get into or out of the body or into or out yes, of the Yes, correct. I'm curious how that how that's done without creating a, a point of moisture ingress and how you ah okay yeah yeah this is a good point uh, so normally this encapsulation was done for um, this uh, peripheral nerve uh, implant that I show almost at the end of the presentation for nerves um, and this included indeed a thin chip and on top of the chip uh, what they do is uh, some uh, electrode connection. Uh, in this case, because of the type of material, this electrode needed to be in gold. And um, the, the critical part indeed is how to create uh, the electrode connection without creating a, a path. So normally that needs also some sort of barrier uh, material, uh, not only uh, at the bottom and on the walls, but indeed, I think that's the weakest link of such implant. Normally, if it fails, it fails through those uh, cavities or connections. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question if no one else does, but uh, Omid, did you want to? Uh, no, no, you go ahead. No one, no one raise hand. If anyone has question can raise hand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question has to do with uh, the operation of, of IMEC and uh, I don't know if you know this uh, Eurovision Song Contest um, that <laughs> exists and uh, Australia and Israel can be considered to be part of Europe when it comes to that. Is there any right. way that we can become part of the, the network of IMEC um, even, <laughs> as a, in a similar way? Uh, because I know there are a number of advantages and we don't have anything like it in in Australia yeah, or yeah. in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so Yeah, so... I think it's possible. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the most common ways for us to collaborate with other countries is through European funding. And uh, normally European uh, projects from European Commission allow a few countries and Australia is included in the list. So uh, uh, Australian institutes can be one of the partners for a European project. Um, and, and that has to do with some um, agreements that Europe and Australia have. I don't have, I don't know the details, but I know that that exists. I so I do know to... projects related where most of the partners are European because that's necessary, but I've seen projects where Australia is, is also included. So do we have to have a European affiliate? We can't go directly to, to IMEC. Is that right? Uh, yeah, but I... Yeah, that is we would like to apply like together. So certainly we can apply together as IMEC Institute, uh, Belgian Institute and mm -hmm. Australia University. We could go together to apply for funding. But yeah, you always need a, a, 
uh, our European partner, but in this case, IMEC could be that partner. Um, and the other way, uh, I've seen collaborations, established collaboration with specific universities. For example, we have now very strong collaboration with uh, John Hopkins University in the US. Uh, so this is also not European, but we have such a strong link to uh, work together in a specific research area also of life science. And this collaboration uh, works um, normally by exchange of uh, either students or postdocs or PhDs, uh, but also of uh, professors. So sometimes we have uh, visiting professors that stay at IMEC uh, for a few months uh, working on a specific project with uh, IMEC uh, facilities are, are needed. So that's another way. And uh, normally it is. Yeah, these connections now, they, they do a lot. So I think it's possible to, to always make a, 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 a very direct link be, uh, between IMEC and a, uh, a university outside. Great, thank you. That's fantastic. OK, uh, I just go to David. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, first, I would like to congratulate you, Carolina, for the fantastic work that you have presented. It's, it's quite amazing uh, to see all, all this research. And I have a couple of questions which are related to, to this probe uh, that you use for measuring neural activity. And um, so one of the questions is that having such density of, uh, of sensors there, uh, it allows you to probe many of these neurons. But I imagine that there is a really hardcore work on spike sorting and how you <laughs> then identify where the signal comes uh, to what uh, sensor, because you know, many of them will be actually Cross talking nearby. Uh, so this is one question. Uh, and the other question, which is related, so maybe you can answer both uh, uh, at the same time, is the community is quite fragmented in that sense, right? So we have people that they look at the brain or the neural system uh, with more macro scales, and they justify that this is the optimum way to look at that, and that it doesn't make sense to look at single neurons. And obviously, you all the you know we have the people that are exactly at the other end of the spectrum that say that if we really want to understand how it works, we need to understand uh, single neurons. So, you know, based on your research and your, your vision, what do you think, if you could put more or less a number, what is the optimal resolution for those arrays that will optimize, you know, getting enough information to be able to explain how the system works um, in, you know, within the, the, the scale possibilities? Yeah. Very good questions. Okay, so I will tackle the first one. Um, so indeed, I think uh, now we have solved a lot the problem of how to get a lot of data. And we got a lot of data, but uh, now the, the, the problem is with neuroscientists. So now they get this amount of data. Uh, they get several gigabits per second in, um, in a single experiment. And uh, the, the problem is what to do what do they do with it? Where do they store it? How do they analyze it, especially if they need real time uh, operation? Uh, so, this is a very, very big bottleneck at the moment. And at IMEC, we didn't work on it until very recently. So, we basically put all the problem to our partners. Okay, you want the data, you have the data, <laughs> now deal with it. Um, and they have great people for software. So they have created all those tools, a specific um, spiking, uh, spike detection and sorting software uh, that they have developed for neural uh, pixels because none of the software before could deal with such an amount of electrodes. So they have developed that, but of course, the softwares work offline. So it's not good for a real time closed loop if they are interested in that. Uh, very recently, we started a time at working on hardware spike sorting. Um, that is a very, very new project that I have now with a postdoc. Uh, we are ex very excited about it. I hope that uh, in some time, a couple of years, maybe we can have some publication on it. Uh, but this indeed, I think now this is uh, the problem. I think we are not looking. Uh, much more now on trying to, to scale. Uh, we have some projects on, yeah, on, on trying to scale, but I think that the, the, the main challenge and main effort should be put in it uh, on how to reduce data, how to analyze it very quickly. 
Um, and your other question is very interesting. So indeed, there are two ways of looking at brain research. And um, I think everybody agrees that going inside the brain is, uh, gives much more information. I think you can learn more of how uh, neurons communicate, how different functions are related to a specific region. Uh, but unfortunately, this technique have very little coverage of the brain. And that's where other tools, uh, you know, such as EEG, ECO, uh, uh, can have uh, a better play if you are trying to look more, uh, let's say, systemic uh, functioning of the brain. And uh, at the moment, it's very difficult to close that gap because it's just very far. So uh, you cannot do uh, with a single tool uh, both things. And uh, so, so yeah, I think that the, the answer is not easy because uh, uh, at the moment, I think there's not an ideal resolution, but uh, I think what we believe and many people as well is that we should try to close that gap. So uh, trying to either increase the coverage of neural probes, so trying to go single cell, but trying to record as much as possible a large brain region. And this can only be done in detail, trying to develop this very large um, density uh, neural probes with maybe multiple shanks. Uh, but at the end, that's also, it, it cannot scale far. I mean, you cannot uh, ambition reading all the brain with a bunch of implantable needles that will also create a lot of damage. So to be honest, my belief is that um, other techniques like optical readouts uh, will maybe become more important in the future for this. They are still not achieving the resolution that is needed. So there, there is a big gap between optical solutions and electrical solutions, uh, but, they, but they are advancing pretty fast. So I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years, you can really do some optical imaging and achieve um, a uh, single cell resolution as we do with neural probes. And I think that will be the way to go, something that is not as invasive as neural right. probes. With that uh, billion dollar uh, question from David, David also asked one of my questions uh, in his first um, question. I, I just, if, if you have time, we know I'm aware of the fact that we are four minutes over. If you have time, maybe- I have uh, time, we yeah. Have, we, we get one more question from Dennis. And then after that, we end the call. Yeah, and I yeah, take my uh, question to you offline. <laughs> yeah, yes. thanks, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, can, can you hear me? Uh, um, a bit louder, Dennis. Uh, OK. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I, I can okay. hear, yeah. OK. So uh, yeah, just, uh, just a couple of questions. Like, like with this uh, uh, PowerPoint that you are showing now, that, that probe, which is the 10 millimeter long, is this part yes. of the, uh, is that this part of the silicon or a different material? Yes, that... yeah. Oh, that's... So I will show. Yeah, maybe here you see it better. So this is the same silicon substrate. So um, what we do is that uh, this, it, it, it all starts with a big piece of silicon, but at IMEC, we kind of shape this probe to have uh, to try to release and create like a needle. And we thin down from the backside the silicon to create also a very narrow, uh, say cantilever or um, this implantable needle, but it all uh, the same silicon uh, piece. That's a pretty amazing engineering there. It's a, there must be a lot of uh... Uh, what waste of silicon as well <laughs> because when you yeah cut it, yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah it, it actually yes if you look at uh, yeah this is how a wafer looks so if you look and this is a piece of silicon but all what is here around the needle is completely wasted uh -huh. so that's why making probes with a very advanced technology node uh, will be very expensive. So normally we try to choose a technology that is affordable because you will waste uh, silicon with yeah. it. That's true. And also yeah. one last question is, uh, what what sort of a foundry service uh, does IMEC uh, provide? Like, do, do you do uh, MPW or multi-project uh, wafer? And also- uh, That's a good question. Um, so IMEC as such, uh, 
doesn't provide those services for CMOS uh, because uh, we have been able to transfer a lot of uh, process development to normal foundries. So we have partnered in the past with uh, foundries uh, for which we have developed certain processes at, at the end we transfer back. So this much, uh, the, the way of working with CMOS for us is just go to typical uh, commercial foundries. Uh, what we have the service at IMEC is to use then a specialty type of processing. And uh, for example, here to create these chips, like kind of MEMS processing, uh, electrode processing, uh, and that's the kind of services that we can provide, but we don't have really like an MPW. Um, for certain services, it's quite a standard. So yeah, you can work. I wouldn't call it an MPW, but more like a, a standard service that you can pay for. And other things uh, can be very customized. So we, we can really develop uh, specific processes to create a shape or, or, or a, a feature that you need. And, and that's, uh, yeah, since it's more specialized, it's not really something that you would go for an MPW, but something that we more agree and, and we develop for you at a certain price. Yeah. Thank you so much. With that, um... Thanks very much, um, Carolina. Thanks everyone for attending. I think that was a really eye opener for the depth and breadth of the research that you're doing in, in IMEC. And hopefully, I think the way forward could be just starting with if you have a PhD student or, or someone who is, who is really interested in any of these fields, get in touch, see if it is possible to you know, uh, think about post COVID and what's what happening after all of these lockdowns and their placement there. Yeah, thank yeah, you very indeed. much, Carolina. So you can contact me by email and if you have more questions or indeed Absolutely. if you want to see opportunities. But thank you very much for an amazing talk. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Have, Bye -bye. Bye -bye. have a good day, Carolina. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.